My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 193. Thank you so much for rocking with this podcast. If this is your first time listening, welcome to the fam. Audio episodes like this got every single Monday. We have three seasons of our video series out where you can watch fantastic Africans sharing their fantastic stories. We also have our tour series where we've gone across Kenya. We've been to Paris, to Zimbabwe, to Dubai twice, and all that while collecting more African stories. Head over to LegallyCluelessAfrica.com to watch. A big shout out to everybody who is part of our Insta family at Legally Clueless Africa. Just gone to the DMs and seeing a lot of love. I took a bit of a one week break <laughs> while I was in Thailand. Uh, I don't know why, I just, I'm really feeling the end of year burnout. And so I just, I just couldn't handle my usual workload last week. But anyway, thank you for being part of the InstaFam. If you're not, head over to Legally Clueless Africa on Instagram. There's a link to it in the show notes. I am super excited about this episode because it has been a long while since we had a random convo. Listen to this. I don't know. I just look at the world different now. Like a lot of stuff that I've been taught growing up in the U.S., I'm just like, I feel like it was conditioning us Mm -hmm. to like keep, you know, black people apart. What do you learn about Africa, if at all? We don't learn much. (laughs) They, They don't teach us much. The things we do learn is just like on pretty much like on TV. It's like if you donate a dollar a day, you'll be feeding a child. Mm. It's pretty much all we know. Yeah, like you have to do your own research. Even in college, I took like an African religious culture course. And it was very just, we just cover like the the broad topics. So they don't teach us much. I think it's intentional. I think so too. You know what I mean? Yeah, because we have the same issue when we're talking about our colonial past. Mm. It always baffles me how I learned about Hitler, but I didn't learn about concentration camps in Kenya during colonization, Mm. you know what I mean? And they were there. We had an apartheid system as Mm. well. In our history, Mm. that kind of gets whitewashed. That's Julian. We have such a fantastic conversation coming up. And I'll tell you more about him a little later in this episode. But first, song of the week. I cannot stop replaying the song. First and foremost, I watched him live in New York in September. You remember a couple of episodes ago, I told you about that spiritual night I had. <laughs> Watching Burner Boy on stage. Well, before Burner Boy, Lucky Day performed an oh my word. His vocals are everything. I also still remember the jacket he was wearing because I was just trying to figure out how do I steal this jacket? It was so beautiful. His music is great. Like not just the top hits, but like I was listening to his entire recent album. And one song that I completely fell in love with is called Ego. I think maybe because I'm currently doing this thing where I check myself whenever I think something in reaction to something someone has done. I'm always like, is that from Ego? Or are we being rational. (laughs) So immediately when I saw the name, I was like drawn to it because I'm in that space. But it's a really nice song and he's he's just so talented. I think I'm slowly becoming a super fan. So check out the song. It's called Ego by Lucky Day. I've put a link to it in the show notes. Still on music. Shout out to you who is listening to our first playlist called Shia Butter on Melanin. There's a link to it in the show notes. It's a collection of songs that feel like Shia Butter being rubbed on beautiful dark skin. And yeah, because of the pressure you've given me since I share music with you to put them into a playlist. So that's playlist number one. I am currently working on playlist number two. I'm very excited about it. It's called Sunrise. And yeah, it's going to be one of those playlists you start your morning with. So I can't wait to share that with you very soon. I'm about halfway done. So let me tell you about Thailand. So last week I was in Thailand. It was my first time not only in Thailand but in Asia sides and I'd gone to host a moth session at the International Conference for Family Planning and the moth is all about storytelling. I love them. I'm part of their family. Honestly, going through their workshop in 2018 has given me the skills to even run Legally Clueless Africa so I absolutely love the moth. The session went so well. Oh, I was so worried I was going to forget bits of my story because when you're hosting, 
you're hosting and you're also telling a story. So it's a lot of work and there's a lot you have to remember. You also are in charge of like the energy flow. You're trying to make the storytellers comfortable, bring the audience along, like so many moving parts. And I don't know why I was doubting myself. Okay, that sounds a bit... But no, seriously, I don't know why I was doubting myself because I really love storytelling. I mean, I prepared well, but like the day before, I was just like me panicking a bit, but it went really well. The session was opened by the president of gender equality at Gates Foundation. Her name is Anita Zaidi, and she was so moved by all our stories. So it was such a win. There were people afterwards, even the hotel, who like came up and were like, we liked your story. And it's it's just affirming, honestly. It's affirming to get that feedback. So it was wonderful. The work that took me there went very well. I didn't do much sightseeing. I was not in Bangkok. I was actually two hours out, which is something I didn't know. (laughs) I was two hours out in a town called Pattaya. That's really pretty, really beautiful. Honestly, it's just so, it's like you're in a rainforest all the time. The weather is so good for your skin. The humidity, I was glowing. (laughs) Oh my goodness. The food. Hey, the food. Let me tell you, if there's one thing I did in Thailand, it was eat. I had so much stir fried chicken in very many different ways. Like I'm even just salivating and thinking about, in fact, my last meal was stir fried chicken. And then when I got to Bangkok before my flight, I had mango sticky rice. Mm -mm -mm Mm-mm-mm-mm. Mm. Oh my goodness. I will definitely be going back. Not only because I didn't go to any tourist attractions. That's like 10% of the reason. 90% though is that food. Because it was really good. Another thing that I saw that was pretty awesome was the first night we arrived. I obviously fell asleep in in the bus because sleep is like what I do best. And when I woke up, we were dropping people at different, their different hotels. We were in this shuttle for the conference and we were reversing from dropping someone. And then I see the signboard of a hotel, a restaurant called Cabbages and Condoms. I'm like, am I really that sleepy (laughs) that I'm hallucinating? So I make a mental note, take a picture and I'm like, I'm going to have to find this place. I'm definitely going to have to have lunch here. So my friend from the moth, Sarah, and I went to have lunch there someday. The food was really great. A lot of condoms everywhere. A lot. Even at our table, under the glass top were like condoms, which was, you know? <laughs> but once they brought that stuff right, chicken, I, I, I couldn't care what is around me. <laughs> but anyway, so the entire restaurant was started by this guy. Unfortunately, I forget his name. It's basically built on the foundation of making condoms as regular as cabbages. So let there be no stigma and shame around buying condoms. Just the same way you go and buy vegetables like cabbages is the same way you should be buying condoms, which is pretty awesome if you think about it. And it's a pretty big chain of restaurants. Like there's one in Bangkok and another in another place in Thailand. And then they have that one in Pattaya. That was quite interesting. I I liked that excursion. Anyway, so I'm back. Another thing that's coming up is 16 days of activism. I just wanted to touch on it slightly. You know, 16 days in the year where... The world is focused on ending gender-based violence. I used to be like super active around it. I am a survivor of sexual violence. But like the more the years come, the more I feel like during those 16 days, survivors are just like tokens. You know what I mean? Like, oh, come for this interview. Oh, do this, do that. And then on the 17th day, it's like silence. Almost like this thing doesn't exist. It feels like organizations and even individuals use it as a time where they can hold up survivors to look like they're doing the very hard work of ending gender-based violence. And that's a blanket statement. I get it. But I have to be honest, it's, it's how I feel. And so I'm finding myself resenting 16 days more and more because I just, I'm like, huh, as a survivor, like it's not 16 days, like it's your entire life. And especially this year, I've had really bad triggers, triggers that have erupted into like full, I don't know, maybe call it episodes, something that I've not experienced before. And so I'm just like, man, this shit is tough. And it's not fair to kind of for 16 days use survivors. I don't know. I That's what I'm feeling right now, it's a blanket statement. There are people who are doing great work all year round, not just across 16 days. But yeah, I just 
oof, I think I feel like 5% resentment and it's it's so uncomfortable. But anyway, I just wanted to share that because this is also my safe space. So uh there we go. Let's jump into random convos. It's really been a while since we had this and I'm really excited about this because my favorite type of content right now is watching people travel through Africa. It could be Africans discovering parts of their countries or other African countries. Honestly, it's similar to what we do with the tour series here. By love, 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 that type of content. And one person whose YouTube show I love because he does this really well is Julian Albino. And he's a full-time solo traveler. He has been traveling through Africa. I think I discovered him when he was in South Africa. I was like, this is so interesting. Then followed him to Rwanda to Kenya for a bit, to Uganda, and then back to Kenya. And then I just decided, you know what? I like this guy so much. He is really in line with what we do here at Legally Clueless Africa. I'm going to shoot my shot. I'm going to DM him and be like, yo, this is who I am. I would love to have you on my podcast. And that's what I did. And he got back to me. And here he is. Random convos on Legally Clueless. I'm super excited to have somebody who's content and youtube has kept me company (laughs) in my village house while i'm cooking when there's no electricity and things are going left i'm just like okay his voice is so soothing and such a companion and we have julian albino who is i think we have adopted you as an honorary african (laughs) i I accept it (laughs) because of the wonderful work that you do but i don't want to give you introduce you with titles and and tags because i guess we're more than that Mm. so who would you say you are okay well (laughs) well my name is julian i am a free spirit person who loves to travel meet new people see the world what he's currently doing is touring a lot of africa which is why i was just like oh my goodness it would be so great to have you legally tool us for that when was the first time you Realize that you loved travel. Twenty, I would say 20, 2019. I was mm-hmm. a flight attendant. Oh wow! Yeah, and that kind of really introduced me to traveling. That yeah. was like my first trip abroad. Yeah, like flying for free. So <laughs> I could literally like wake up on my off day and like, you know what? I want to go to Argentina, and it was free. Wow! So I really, really enjoyed that. But I wasn't a good flight attendant. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I I don't know. I'm just not like a like a nine to five type of person, you know? Mm-hmm. So being on time, <laughs> like, you know, and for flights, you have to be on time. So I, yeah, I wasn't cut out for that, but it mm. really opened my eyes to traveling. So 2020, I set a plan to figure out how to make money and mm-hmm. travel and YouTube came in. So that was always a plan, but you didn't start with traveling around Africa. So where did you start off first? Well, it's funny. I remember in 2020 when I was planning to leave at the top of 2021, (laughs) I was telling all my family and friends back home, like, I'm moving to Africa. I'm going to Africa. And then in December of 2020, I was like, whoa, that's really far. You know, (laughs) let me try somewhere a little closer first. So I went to Mexico Mm -hmm. for like six months to see if I could really like earn an income. Yeah. Like while traveling abroad. So after six months, I'm like, you know what? Let me go to Africa. So I went to South Africa. That was my first time on the continent, first country. And it was it was amazing. How do you pick the country? So like South Africa, do you speak to people? Do you just do like a Google search? Do you? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I literally, I'll type in Google like uh, countries, U.S. passport can go without a visa. And, you know, I just go on that list and pick one. Yeah. <laughs> And what's one thing that maybe gives you anxiety when you're going to a completely new country? Mm. At least the visa issue is like out because you're like, okay, fine. It's a list of countries that you don't need a visa to get into or maybe it's visa on arrival. What other things could give you anxiety? anxiety? I don't know. I'm just so like, I'll just figure it out as I go. Mm. Yeah, I don't really go with many plans or expectations. I just go with the flow. I would say probably housing. Yeah. Because I don't like staying in hotels. Trying to find like a a safe place, a comfortable place. Because when I travel, I like to stay in a country for at least 30 days. So I think that's probably like the biggest headache I have sometimes. I remember watching your videos and a friend of mine said what they admire most is that you go somewhere where you don't know anybody and you end up making friends. And yeah. they were like, how does yeah. he make friends? <laughs> like, how does, so, so who is, so you land in South Africa. Where exactly in, in SA do you go to? Uh, I went to Johannesburg first. Okay. Yeah, I was in Johannesburg. So how do you make 
the first friend? How did I make my first friend when I got there? I just talked to people. Yeah. You know what I've learned like on the continent here? Like people are friendly. Mm -hmm. You can literally just say hi to people and your best friend. So I remember my first day I went to Sandton City Mall mm -hmm. and met a guy. Well, he was flirting with me. <laughs> Like, you're so beautiful. <laughs> and then we became friends. Yeah. And then he introduced me to a lot of his friends. And I'm still friends with those people now. That's really cool. Yeah. Do you remember the first the first thing that was different once you're in Johannesburg from home or like that you had to adapt to or change? I would say, honestly, in South Africa, it mm. wasn't much of mm. like an adjustment. Mm. Yeah, I feel like you can. I've, honestly, I feel like the the quality of living better in South Africa <laughs> than the U.S. Yeah. So I didn't have that much of a culture shock. I didn't feel it until I went to uh, Rwanda. Oh, really? And I was like, oh, I'm in Africa. <laughs> 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 I said, oh, baby, we're in Africa now. <laughs> so when you look back on your first trip to South Africa, how many? How long were you there? Well, I only planned to stay for 30 days. Yeah. And I loved it so much. I stayed my entire visa length, which was 90 days. <laughs> yeah. Three months. <laughs> Three months. Like, I, I didn't want to leave. Yeah. They were like, uh, you got one more day. <laughs> you know, you're going to be like illegal here. So I had to leave. <laughs> so when you look back, what are some things that, you know, those things you look back on and you're just mm -hmm. like, oh, that was such like a, a heartwarming experience. Yeah. Where it was literally when I first landed in Johannesburg um, at the airport and I was waiting for like my Uber guy and I was talking to like a random airport worker. Yeah. And he was like, where are you from? I'm like, the States. And he was like, welcome home, brother. And I don't know. It just oh. it hit me. I was like, can I have a hug? Can yeah. we just hug? <laughs> but yeah, I got that a lot when I first got there. They were like, welcome home, welcome mm. home, welcome home. I don't know. That really resonated with me. Yeah, yeah, that is so powerful. I remember going for a conference in Senegal. Wow. And it was for people of African descent. And so there was this particular African-American guy who came for the conference. When we were walking around the town, he just kept staring. And I thought he was like taking it in, like, you know, first time in Senegal. And he yeah. was like, I've never been around only Black people. Yeah. There is like a homely feel yeah. that he was like, I've never experienced this. Like, I don't have to kind of look over my shoulder all I the time. exactly what he means, yeah. And so he, I was like, actually... I don't know. I can't, I can't read. I, this is all I've ever known, yeah, you know? Yeah. And so was that, was there a sense of that, like feeling like. Absolutely. Because, you know, growing up in the States, like being black, we literally have to think about being black before we leave, like for our safety. I remember in school, like I was always the only black person. Mm -hmm. My only job, I was the only black person. So I don't know. It's just different coming here and you're just like. Okay, it's like seven other other people who look just like me, you yeah. know? So it's just a very, I don't know, I felt like connected to something. Mm. I'm like, it just makes sense to be here. That's powerful. You know? I think that's a very, very powerful feeling. Yeah. What experiences while we're in South Africa introduce you to a specific culture? Because mm. obviously there are many different communities and tribes, yeah, yeah. but like, did you experience something that you you learned about a particular community? Yeah, one of my friends, he invited me to... Um, like a traditional Zulu wedding mm. and that it was amazing it was just so different from weddings I've been to yeah yeah it was just very I could feel the love and it was just a lot of dancing and like the culture and they had on like you know tr traditional wear yeah so I really love that experience and did they teach you the language and I'm still learning <laughs> I'm still learning I'm still learning but I, I want to learn Swahili first yeah because people have told me, like, if you really want to, like, you know, settle in Africa, mm. Swahili should be the first language. Yeah, because it's spoken in, in quite a few yeah. countries as well. Yeah. And when you're in South Africa, what's the feedback you're getting from back home? What are questions <laughs> people are asking? <laughs> oh, are they like, oh, yeah. when are you coming back? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got so many crazy questions mm. like, what do you sleep in? And I'm like, what do you mean I sleep in a bed? And yeah. they're like... What? Yeah, they're like, where do you shop? Are there malls there? Mm. Like, they're just really shocked. Because, you know, the things we see on TV from the States about Africa mm. is not the things I'm trying to show on my YouTube channel. Exactly. You know? So even now, like, being a queer person, too, they're like, 
are you unsafe? Mm. Is it dangerous? And I'm like, no, guys, no one really pays me any attention here. And I love that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Because you're not, again, going back to like, you're not the only black person. Exactly. That, you know? Exactly. And I think we have in many African cultures, like if you get a sense that somebody is a foreigner, obviously, if it's like a cab guy or whatever, mm. they'll try and like get an extra buck from you. Yeah. yeah but yeah. more than anything, the first thing is like, Okay, like the guest is here, like welcome them. They yeah. make sure they have a good experience, yeah. you know. So the hospitality is very real here. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a big thing for us. So your ninety days are wrapping up. Mm-hmm. You literally have one day. <laughs> literally, I didn't have a, a flight book, nothing. I remember I was in Zant, and I'm like, where am I gonna go? Where am I gonna go? Where am I gonna go? So I went on Google, <laughs> you know, visa free countries. Rwanda popped up. And I'm like, you know what, Kigali, here I come. <laughs> So I went. I had no expectations, but I had a good time. Yeah. I had a good time. What I love about what's happening is like you're moving from South and Africa. And yes, each each country has their own individual identity. And within that, many other identities, yeah. different communities. But the similarities in regions. So like if you're in South and Africa, there'll be some similarities, yeah. right? Across, say, Botswana in South Africa. But you're leaving. <laughs> yeah, I went from Southern to like Eastern. <laughs> yeah. And so when you arrive in Rwanda, take me through like the first couple of days. Let me think, let me think, let me think. I mean, I definitely felt like I, I stood out there. Yeah. Yeah, the the stairs, the attention was real. I remember the first day I landed, you know, I got a Sims card for my phone. Mm-hmm. I walk into the phone store and, you know, everyone's just talking, doing their business. And I walk in, the entire store just stopped and <laughs> stares at me. And I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. so I got a, a lot of, I don't know, I kind of felt uncomfortable. If yeah. Honest, you know? Yeah. But I think I just wasn't used to people staring, so... Mm-hmm. I think after like the second or third day, I just started saying hello back. You know, like if you <laughs> yeah. got to stare, I say hello. And then I realized like, wow, these people are friendly. Mm. You know, I think I just, I look different. And then maybe it speaks to like the different cultures have different personalities, exactly. different histories as yeah. well, you yeah. know, that influence our personalities and right. how we behave. Right. So where do you go to in Rwanda? What are some of the things that you experience? Let's see. Oh, that was like a year ago. <laughs> Thinking Rwanda, Rwanda, Rwanda. What did I do? I remember my first, I got there around like Halloween. So, you know, I like to party. If you know my channel, <laughs> I like to party. So I went to a Halloween party and I was like dressed up, a yeah. full little costume. And I, I realized like the party scene there is very like relaxed. Like, you know, I'm in an outfit ready to party. And we get to the party and people are playing like sand beach volleyball. <laughs> and it was just different. It was very different. I don't feel like I did that much in Rwanda. Yeah. Because honestly, I went there because in Johannesburg, I party so much yeah. for 90 days. So I told myself in Rwanda, I just kind of want to relax, get, you know, get my, my, my business, my work together. Yeah. So I just, I just chilled a lot, honestly. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's a good place to chill. It's very silent. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's very silent. But I think there's like, yeah, again, different personalities. If, if you gave each African country mm. a persona, like we would be, very similar, but like stock opposites yeah. in some cases. Yeah. So how long were you in Rwanda for? I was there for 30 days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then on the 29th day, is <laughs> that when you're like, Ugh. you know, it was, it was another situation <laughs> where I, I found out that I could go back to South Africa. Yeah. I thought I had to go back to my home country mm. before I could go back. And they were like, no, you can leave for two days and your visa will be renewed. Mm. So when I found that out, I'm like, oh baby, I'm going to Cape Town. (laughs) So I went back and went to Cape Town and stayed there for like four months. Oh, wow. Yeah. So clearly you like, did you love Cape Town a bit more? Mm, It's beautiful. Views. Mm -hmm. Like I just wanted to wake up and go outside. Yeah. Just to like look, you know? But I honestly, I like Joburg better. Yeah. Like in Cape Town, I kind of got the same tension with racism yes like that's real there yeah it was hard for me to find an apartment um i would meet with an well i would communicate with an agent and she's like yeah come tomorrow at 10 a.m and then she finds out i'm black i don't know how yeah and then she'll make up an excuse like oh i'm sorry we're repairing the place it won't be available for six months then that happened again she was like oh i'm sorry we just booked it and i'm like it just happened. Yeah. yeah. Too many times. Too many times. Yeah. I was looking in Camps Bay, which is like a really, I guess, exclusive area. Mm-hmm. 
And one of the agents literally told me like, yeah, you know, we're really selective about the kind of people we want here. Mm -hmm. You know, we like a certain type. He, you know, he was saying it without saying yeah. it, you know? And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So I felt that there. Yeah. Because, and I have, I haven't been to Cape Town. Mm -hmm. I'm going in a couple of weeks and okay. I remember, but a good friend of mine who is Kenyan, black Kenyan, yeah. and she's married to a white Irish man okay. and they went to Cape Town once and she's just like it was so strange and everybody's looking at you so the staff are mainly black mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so they're looking at you like how did you <laughs> what's yeah. going on yeah and she's coming with our Kenyan history that's similar in some situations but quite different as well so we yeah. can't really re the way we relate with racism is very different okay and so she was like it was beautiful but it was strange she's like yeah. it was just a strange experience. <laughs> it, it really is. There was yeah. one moment that really stuck out. The um, apartment building I was living in, well, the hotel building, I'm sorry, in yeah. Cape Town. I'm waiting for the elevator to go up to the apartment. And there were like two white girls checking in. And, you know, after they check in, they come to the elevator. And she looks at me and she's like, here are my bags. We're on the 11th floor. Like, and I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. And I'm like, what do you want me to do with your bag? Yeah. And she was just like, Oh, are you? Do you not work here? And I was like, girl, girl, you knew, no, yeah, you knew I didn't work here. Yeah. Like, don't be rude. Stuff like that. But Cape Town is beautiful. And so you're in Cape Town for four months. So that's like a different cultural experience, no? Yeah. How do you make friends? Actually, in that setting, how how did you make friends? Well, at that point, like you know, the YouTube had picked up, and mm -hmm. I've noticed. Whenever I'm in a new country or a new city, after I post like the first video that I'm there. So many people reach out on Instagram, you know, yeah. like, this is how I'm here now. Yeah. So it's kind of very easy to make friends. Cape Town, it was mainly like wine farms. Mm. That's like every other day I'm at a wine farm. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts off, the thing with like these wine tours, mm. it starts off being so cultured. You're just yeah. like, yeah, this is like what mature people do. Right, right. And by the end, you're sloshed. <laughs> Literally, I went to be classy. Yeah. In the night, it was like girls going wild. Exactly. <laughs> so you're you're in Cape Town for four months, mm -hmm. and um, is it another situation where your visa is? Yeah, but at that time, because I was living in a hotel for yeah. four months. Wow, I was tired and it was expensive, mm -hmm. so I was like mentally drained. And I called my mom like, girl, I need to come home. Like, I, I need to reset. <laughs> yeah. so I went home for like a month and a half yeah. to just like not do anything. I just mm -hmm. wanted to relax, mm -hmm. you know? So went back to the States and then that's when Kenya popped up. Mm -hmm. And my friend that I met, an American, I met her in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And she's like, hey, I have a house on the coast of uh, Kenya, but I'm in Thailand. So if you want to go, it's free. Just get there. Yeah. So two days later, I was like, I'm going to Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> so I came to Kenya. Do you do any Google search before you go to a place to like, and, and what sort of things popped up about Kenya? I don't. Because uh. I like to go with like no mm. preconceived notions, no expectations. Because mm. what you see online would be so different. Yeah. You know, so I just like to go. Make my own experience. Well, see, I, the things I knew about Nairobi was it was like party capital. <laughs> so as soon as I landed, I was like, I'm going out. It was a Friday too. Yeah. So I literally, I think I went to like five clubs by myself that night. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And that was like my first Kenya video, which is like my, still like one of my like most viewed videos. Mm -hmm. So I met so many people that night. And I realized, like, I think Nairobi, well, Nairobi is like the Las Vegas mm -hmm. of Kenya. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember I was going to Alchemist. And you know, like, the dirt road across from Alchemist yeah. where all the, like, um, what are they, the, the matatus? Yeah. So it was like a, a couple between two matatus, you know, <laughs> coupling. And they saw me and they just, they didn't stop. They were just, I was like, oh, this place is wild. <laughs> That was one of the craziest moments. <laughs> coupling. <laughs> they were just coupling, you know? It was very funny. Oh my goodness. It I was keep the fact that they saw me and they just they just kept going. <laughs> it's more like they, you were in the wrong place. Yeah, they're like, you're interrupting <laughs> us, you know? <laughs> oh my goodness. And what time of year is this you're in Nairobi? I came in May. In so May. So I think that was maybe winter or mm, going into winter. Very, very cold. Yeah, it was very cold. Yeah. <laughs> So then looking for a place, because you say you don't like living in hotels. Mm. So how was the experience trying to figure out an apartment? Housing here. Yeah. So 
I, when I came to Kenya, I was in Nairobi for two days, and mm -hmm. then I was scheduled to go to Kilifi. Mm -hmm. uh, went out there for 10 days, and I met this really nice lady. She took me on, um, I forgot what it's called. We went on, like, the boat. Beautiful. And I just kind of brought up, like, oh, I'm going back to Nairobi, but I don't have a place. Yeah. And she has a friend here who's a real estate agent, so she connected me mm. with him, and that's how I found the place. I think I remember seeing that video where you were looking at views. and Yeah. And it's always so interesting to watch. Is like to try and figure out where where, where, where is he? Yeah. Like, okay, I know that little thing. I know like, where's thing. Waldo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's like until afterwards, I'm like, ah, uh. okay, I know where he was. <laughs> so, what was that experience like? Was it more difficult than looking for a place back home? Or no, I think it was much easier back home. Mm. You know, they do so many different credit checks. Mm. Blood tests, it seems like <laughs> they just want so much verification. Whereas here, it's like money talks. So yeah. if you got the money, you, you move in. Yeah. yeah. But I do feel like I was being a little overpriced at first. Yeah. You know, like I saw like the same unit with two different agents. And it was one agent quoted me 200000 mm -hmm. per month. And then the other agent quoted me like four fifty. Wow. Per month, you know? And I'm yeah. Like, That's crazy. So yeah. before I even decided to move there, I started talking to some of the neighbors. And I'm like, hey, like, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you're comfortable <laughs> telling me, how much are you paying? So it was kind of around the same yeah. price. And I'm like, okay, I feel like I'm getting a, a decent price. <laughs> oh, we're all, let's all be scammed yeah, together. Let's all be scammed. <laughs> <laughs> but that's smart. I think Nairobi teaches you how to be street smart. If yeah. anything, yeah. that's what you leave with. You yeah, know? that's so true. Yeah. So you find a place, um, you come back from Kilifi. Mm -hmm. And so you're in Nairobi for a bit more. How do you make friends here? Do people reach out? And, and kind of what are some mm. of the experiences you have after Kilifi? Yeah, so when I first got to Nairobi, one of the guys at the hotel, mm -hmm. like, we just clicked. Mm -hmm. So uh, he took me out. I met all of his friends. And then we all became friends. And then again, at that point, I had, like, a couple videos up. So mm -hmm. people were like, oh, let's hang out. Let me show you around. I feel like Kenyans really want to make sure you have a good time mm -hmm. on, you know, the trip here. So people were just really just wanting me, like, just wanted to show me new places. Yeah. So that's how I made friends. And what are the questions now from back home, specifically about Kenya? Mm. Were there people still asking the same questions? As same question. Are you serious? Same, same. <laughs> I think it was even more like yeah. outrageous yeah. versus like the South African questions. They're yeah. like, so are there like, you know, lions walking around? <laughs> like, it's just crazy <laughs> questions, you know, like, but it was mainly like safety. They're like, are you safe there? And I'm like, guys, honestly, I feel a lot more safe here mm -hmm. than back in the States. I think yeah. it speaks to like us being able to, as Africans, as Kenyans, et cetera, tell our own stories and even like the content that you do. Yeah. Because it's been told from a very Western lens and it's only told when there is a crisis, exactly. you know, and then if there's a crisis in Westlands, the story is told like there's a crisis across Kenya, exactly. you know? <laughs> People don't understand that. It's just like one exactly. part of the country. Yeah. So it's like, okay, it's really time for us to tell our own stories, mm. even visually. Because before, if you watch something on, let's say, for example, CNN, you didn't have a reference point. Like, okay, exactly. so what else? Exactly. How do I know they're telling the truth or it's exactly. not biased, you know? But now there's, there's, there's options. So that's that's why this is important. And so what other memorable experiences do you go through your second time now in Nairobi after mm -hmm. Kilifi? Is it more mm -hmm. partying, Julian? No, 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 no. <laughs> I've actually been more just focused on my content, yeah. like meeting people, trying yeah. to meet the right people. I feel like I've been to most of the parties here. It's the same 25 songs they play. <laughs> I got that vibe. <laughs> So, yeah, I haven't done much yeah. partying. I yeah. went out Halloween weekend, yeah. but that was it. Yeah. You know, like this time I'm trying, I honestly, I want to get out of Nairobi and see more of Kenya. Mm. But it's really hard getting around with without a car. Yeah. Especially if you're going to not the Mombasa's or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Like I wanted to go like in like Western Kenya to like um, Kisumu, mm. things like that. But even when I try to rent a car, um, I called a place and they're like... Um, 5,000 per day. And then I have one of my Kenyan friends call and they're like 3,000 per day. I was going to say, <laughs> I'm like, man, this is crazy. It's, it's the accent. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Well, we will make sure that you get someone, especially Kisumu. I think the sunsets in Kisumu are just like really? 
out of this world, okay. out of this world. I got to make that happen. So, but, you know, we've jumped. We've, we're talking about your second trip to Nairobi. Mm. But after you come back from Kilifi, you're in Nairobi for a few days. Then you go back. Do you go home or where do you go to? No, no, no. So after Kilifi, when I returned to Nairobi, I stayed for like a month. And, but it was like the the middle of winter mm-hmm. at this point. And it was so cold, I didn't even want to leave the house. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go to South Africa again, you know? <laughs> That's like my reset place. So I stay there for three months. And then I'm like, you know what? I think Kenya should be a little warmer now. Mm-hmm. Let me go back. Yeah. Oh, but before I came back to Kenya, I, I made a pit stop in Uganda. How was UG? <laughs> <laughs> Uganda, um, it was... Um, it was interesting. I, I don't feel like, I don't, I don't think I got like a good, I don't know, experience with it. I didn't do anything in yeah. Kampala, you know? I just, I stayed at the hotel. We rode around on the, um, the boat us, yeah. uh, but the traffic was crazy. Oh, yeah. People only recommended like partying for me. That's <laughs> all I know about you. You can yeah. know, we have to change this. <laughs> Literally, when I posted that video, all the comments were like, oh, that sucks. You miss, this is like the best nightlife. Yeah. But for some reason, I just was not in the mood to party, Mm -hmm. you know? I just, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't feeling it. Maybe you have to go back and maybe get out of Kampala. Yeah. Yeah. I think I need to know someone. That seems like a place you need to know Mm -hmm. someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I literally didn't know a soul there. (laughs) So you're there for how long? Uh, I think maybe seven or eight days. Yeah. Yeah. Then you come back. Back to Nairobi. What was the decision to come back? Was it, was it always the plan and you just ducked? for the weather to get yeah. its act together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I planned on staying in maybe Uganda for like 30 days. Yeah. But I'm like, you know what? Let me just cut this short and go back to Nairobi. Yeah. So, and I love the food here. Like oh. I have not had bad food in Nairobi. Oh, really? Yeah, I love the food here. What What are some things that you've loved? Uh, ugali. Mm-hmm. I, me and uh, Dennis, we made that last night. <laughs> Okay, so he met Dennis Karui, mm-hmm. who's been on actually this week his stories on the audio episode. Oh wow, that's right? so cool. Yeah, and so but he's been on the video series, the third season, and so mm-hmm. he's he's a friend of Legally Clueless, and so you were in good hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so he taught you how to make ugali. Ugali, and then we made um. Don't tell me the word. Um, Nia Chama. Nyama Choma. Nyama Choma. Yeah, <laughs> we made that. Yeah. <laughs> and then I uh, I like chapati. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I just like the food here. It's seasoned very well. That's so interesting because um, we get a lot of flack from other African mm. countries for having the least spiced food, which in, in some... What? Yeah, they're just like, you guys are the British. <laughs> Your food doesn't food have like, enough spices, enough uh, taste. And... When I do travel, especially to like Western African countries, mm. I'm like, this is so much spice. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, what's yeah. happening, guys? <laughs> it's like spice with a side of meat. Like, yeah, what's happening? Literally. What is it? Uh, is yeah. it a uh, igusu soup? Egusi. Egu- okay, yeah. yeah. Try that. Yeah. So spicy. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, I thought my ears were going to fall off. <laughs> oh my goodness. So now you come back and I'm hearing you talk of a lot more opportunity that you're seeing in Nairobi. Yeah. Maybe you could tell us more about that. Yeah, I I don't know. I feel like coming back, I'm, I'm meeting the right type of people mm-hmm. who want to collab. Like, I'm meeting a lot of creatives mm-hmm. in Nairobi. I didn't know like the creative scene was so big here. So I can I can really see myself like if I make this like my home base. Yeah. I can do a lot of creative work here. Yeah. I really, really like that. And we're at a really good point. I think there's a lot more hope and a lot more color in the creative industry now. Mm -hmm. A lot more collaborations Mm -hmm. and just a lot less fear in like owning our identity. And like we don't have to be anything but, you know. And so it's a good time. Kenyans are very proud to be Kenyan. And I love that. I love that. And as someone who does social media, I'm realizing Kenyans love social media. (laughs) (laughs) They love social media. In terms of like the people who consume your shoe mm. a lot are Kenyans top. Yeah. Of, yeah. Really? Kenyans, SA, yeah. and the States. That's yeah. Those awesome. are always like my top three like countries. Yeah. And so maybe you could speak to what has it changed? So you've been to all of these African countries completely different from home. Yeah. And how do you think that experience has like expanded you just on a personal level. Yeah, I definitely yeah. feel like I've grown. Mm-hmm. I spoke to my mom just for, I think two or three days ago and she's like, Julian, I can, I can hear the maturity in your voice. <laughs> like, I, I really feel like I'm changing, mm-hmm. you know? Um, 
I don't know. I just look at the world different now. Like a lot of stuff that I've been taught growing up in the U.S., I'm just like, I feel like it was conditioning us mm-hmm. to like keep, you know, Black people apart across mm-hmm. the, 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 the planet. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I feel like with the opportunities I have being from the States, I want to use that and bring it over here. Because mm-hmm. I really want to, I want to find like a, a home base and make um, somewhere in Africa, my home. Mm. Yeah. I just don't even see myself living in the States anymore. <laughs> I'm like, for what? Why? Like anything I need or want, I can get it here, yeah. you know, and be around people who look like me. And maybe you could talk to, cause we don't really know a lot of, let's say, what does the education system look like in terms of in the States? What do you learn about Africa? If at all. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we don't learn much. They, they don't teach us much. The things we do learn is just like, On pretty much like on TV, it's like, if you donate a dollar a day, you'll be feeding Mm. a child. That's pretty much all we know. Yeah. Like you have to do your own research. Even in college, I took um, like an African religious culture um, course. And it was very just, we just covered like the the broad topics, nothing Mm. like really in depth, you know? Mm. So they don't teach us much. I think it's... um, intentional. I think so too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because we have the same issue when we're talking about our colonial past. Mm. So we will learn about other countries. It always baffles me how I learned about Hitler. Mm. Not to say it's bad to know what happens in other parts of the world. Yeah. But I didn't learn about concentration camps in Kenya during colonization. Mm. You know what I mean? And they were there and we had kind of like, we had an apartheid system as Mm. well. There was so much torturing. There was so much, but like in our history, Mm. that kind of gets whitewashed and it's just like, oh, colonization was just like little bleep and they're like, and then we're back, independence. (laughs) (laughs) Right, like even in the States, they, you know, the education system, we learned about like the Holocaust. Uh, But like, why, why don't we learn about like the genocide Mm -hmm. over here? You know, like it's just very white, white, you know? Right now, what I think is happening with this African awakening is we're trying to piece together our identity and all of a sudden we have access to this information. We're able to question without disappearing and, you know, and so it's, it's quite an interesting, interesting time. So what about, do your family ever want to come visit? Like when you tell them stories, are they like, Hey, we can't wait to come. Uh, I don't know. I think I, I'm like the black sheep of my family. (laughs) Like my, I, I tell, I'm the only one in my family with a passport. Oh, really? You know, like they just don't have any kind of desire or interest mm-hmm. in traveling. But I mean, long term goal, I want to like buy a house here and move my mom out here. Mm-hmm. You know, she's single, so mm-hmm. and she's struggling in the U.S. Yeah. And I'm like, girl, life could really be different. Don't have to live like that. So, but no, they 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 have no really like real interest in yeah. traveling. Not just Africa, but like anywhere. I read something on like um, CNN. One night, and it was saying, I don't know the percentage, maybe like 60% of Americans just don't travel. Don't wow. even have a passport. And you know why that's so shocking is that the American passport is one of the strongest, if yeah. not the strongest. I don't right? think it's the strongest, but yeah. it's up there. Yeah. You know? So there's a lot more countries. So I do the same thing mm. as you do, like Google, like, where don't I need a visa? Which I'll tell you about Ghana. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. Kenyans, we don't need a visa uh. to go in. <laughs> I was like, this is great. But I think our list is much shorter uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> than if I had an American yeah. an American passport. So that's yeah. interesting. But I think that's because like a lot of Americans, we were taught like this is the best country in the mm. world. Like, you know, extreme patriotism. So yeah. I just feel like maybe a lot of Americans feel like, what's the point if Mm. I'm in the best place? And it's like, you're not. (laughs) You really should get out there in the world and see other places, you know? When you say, that's so interesting because we always talk about, for there was a period, I think now it may be reducing, but there was a period where a lot of Kenyans were trying to get out and get to the States. And Mm. this is the same for quite a few African countries. So if you look at like Nigeria. Yeah. Just it was like, if you want a better life, yeah. get out of here and go to the States. To some extent, you can understand that because there was probably like political tension in those mm-hmm. years. Economically, there were not many opportunities, opportunities here. Yeah. But like, is it that easy to to make it in the States? Is, is that? I think so. Mm-hmm. At first, I didn't. Mm-hmm. But since I've been traveling, I've, re- I've been able to understand my own privilege mm-hmm. and the things that we take for granted. It's like, yeah, like, 
I don't know. I remember I was talking to my mom and she was complaining about, I hope she doesn't listen. (laughs) (laughs) She was complaining about like some, some institutional organization that was like assisting her with some funds, you know, to like help her like financially. And she was like, oh, they were supposed to give me this money by this date and this date. And she was just really upset. And I'm thinking like, okay, they may be, uh, you know, a day or two late, but they're giving you this money. Whereas a lot of other countries, Mm -hmm. they just don't even have that like option, you Mm -hmm. know? We complain about like, if you go to school there and you get like loans, the maybe the high interest rates that Mm -hmm. you have to pay back. And I'm like, at least you're getting Mm -hmm. the, the funds to even get that education. What did you find is more of a convenience here Mm -hmm. or is probably structured better here than at home? I think if you have like a entrepreneur spirit, Mm -hmm. it's much easier and like less loopholes to Mm -hmm. start a business. Oh really? Yeah. In the States. Oh my God. It's, it's just so many like loopholes mm. and like permits and sort of just things to make money. Even me, like I have a real estate business back home and every year I have to pay $1,500 just to, it's called a privilege fee. And they don't tell you where that money goes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just literally a fee they want to charge just yeah. to get money from you. It's just, everything is just money. What about socially? Because I don't know about the States, but I do remember visiting a friend in London and I think the African in me was just like, what is going on here? Uh Because uh we went to his apartment block and first there was no guard. There was no Ascari Mm. and everything was so electronic. I was like, oh, so who lives this side? And he's like, oh, I don't know. Mm. So he didn't know his neighbors. And I was like, what do you mean? (laughs) And I was like... This is so different. I need to meet the guard, hear the a bit of small talk, what happened yeah, today, yeah. that somebody from the electricity company come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's part of the routine. Exactly. And then know my neighbor, oh, she's in now, mm. or oh, her kid is sick, or like, yeah. you know, is that the same? Very different in the States. Yeah. yeah. When I got here, I'm like, wow, people are just so, just they just want to talk. Yeah. You know, like back home, I don't know none of my neighbors. Like, do not knock on my door. Don't ask me for mm. a couple sugar you know it's just very different like i think in the, the u.s is very just um like an individualism type of society mm. like every man for themselves yeah it really is like that it's like extreme version of capitalism yeah obviously there is privilege that comes with being, being able to travel mm. but how can you kind of with all you've done have you gotten some tips that could help in terms of budgeting, in terms Mm. of like trying to make the most of your trip, making friends, you know, it's not, it's not the easiest of things. What are some tips you can give? I I would say definitely try to secure maybe some type of remote work Mm. or let's say like you're coming from the West. I would say, make sure you have like consistent flow of, let's say US dollars coming in. Like when I left the US, I left for like a thousand dollars. Like I did not have a lot of money. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do this YouTube and it has to work. Like this yeah. has to work. In like 30 days, I got monetized. Oh, wow. Yeah, like I was very, very serious about that. Uh, but I would say just try to make sure you have some kind of income coming in. I think... I mean, I think I'm kind of like a like a bougie traveler, but if you're like a more budget traveler, if you can just make maybe a thousand dollars a month, mm. you can you can survive. Coming with a thousand dollars as it's running out, what's going through your head? I was freaking out. <laughs> I was freaking out because the thing is, like, the place I was staying in in Mexico <laughs> was eight hundred dollars, so I only had like two hundred dollars to make stuff work. So I mean, I'm a hustler, really. Mm. So. I started like revising people's resumes for Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And then like I mentioned, I also, I have a real estate business. I mean, I'm kind of part-time with it. So once the money was getting low at the end of the month, I'm like, okay, I need to sell a house really quick. So Mm -hmm. I did. And that's kind of how, like the first year I would sell a house, you know, get a lump sum of money and just kind of live off that Mm -hmm. until YouTube became more like consistent income. Yeah, And with YouTube, what works? I know already... When you're creating from Africa, you can't make as much as a creator based in the States. Yeah. Yeah, It's interesting. Like I mentioned, like South Africa and Kenya are my top like countries. Mm -hmm. But the the CPM, the amount YouTube pays you Mm -hmm. is very low. I think it's maybe like three or four dollars per view versus 
US, uh, like a viewer is like $20. Wow. Yeah. So it's a big difference. So I, I realized like, okay, I can't really rely on just the YouTube income, the mm -hmm. AdSense money. So that's where sponsorships came in. What I still do to this day, literally every week, I spend maybe two days where I reach out to 10 brands a day. I'll mm. send an email to them like, this is my channel. These are my analytics. You know, I'm interested in this. Like, I love your suitcase. I would love to mm. promote it to my audience. Let's collab. And yeah, like that, that's the real income. Mm. I don't even look at YouTube money anymore. Mm. It's mainly sponsorships. Yeah. I think like 90% of the work is pitching. Yeah. And you have yeah. to pitch with your chest. Like exactly. <laughs> I used to just wait for them to come yeah. in, but you know, it 60 days, nothing was coming in. I'm like, you know what? I got I got to pitch myself. So yeah. I do that now. And that's how I that's how I'm living. Mm, <laughs> yeah. That's really, really interesting. And in terms of like the social aspect, um, building a community home mm. while you're traveling, like mm. where is home? What is home? You know, I had that moment in um South Africa a couple of months ago. I almost had a mental breakdown because mm. I was like, I don't have a home. Like mm. I literally, I feel like I'm like uh like a just like a popular homeless person. <laughs> <laughs> like, I genuinely don't have a home. So I think now going, like, my goal for 2023 is to secure, like, an actual home base. Mm -hmm. Like, I need a home. Like, those moments where I'm kind of burnt out from traveling. Yeah. I want to be able to just go home, rest, and then, you know, go back out in the world. And what is that looking like? It's looking like Nairobi. Good. It's looking <laughs> like Nairobi. For for many reasons, I can tell, like, Nairobi is, is growing. There's a lot of construction here. Mm -hmm. So the moments that I'm not traveling, I can use that property as an investment property. Mm -hmm. Get that cash flow coming in. Yeah. As long as it's not in Kilimani, I say this because... I'm not <laughs> <laughs> Why not Kilimani? <laughs> it's a dubious activity. <laughs> Shout out to everybody listening who lives in Kilimani. We love you. <laughs> you get... It was it, it, somebody said it's like the Florida of. <laughs> oh, that, oh god, that's funny. Really. I used to live in Florida, <laughs> only for like four months, and I left. <laughs> now you see how you get all of these wild stories that yeah. come. Florida's wild. Yeah, I can see that. Our wild stories come from <laughs> money. <laughs> <laughs> no, and do you have any in closing just life lessons that you've learned? maybe specific to traveling the continent mm. or specific to just traveling in general? Yeah. Uh, I, I think I would say, you know, if you want to do something, whether it's traveling or anything in life, like just don't let other people project their fears onto you. Because mm -hmm. I remember before I started traveling, I told all my friends and family, like, I'm going to move to Africa. I'm going to travel. And like, literally, I probably only had two people that were supportive. Everyone mm. else was like, are you crazy? Why would you go? You're going to die. Like, don't go to Mexico. The mafia is going to get you. And it's just like, I, I would say, you know, go to a place, create your own experience, create your own narrative because other people can really like put their fears on you and you can miss out on a great experience. Most of the people who are loudest have no information backing yeah. that opinion. Like <laughs> Everyone that was like, you know, don't go to Kenya, don't go to SA. <laughs> I'm like, oh, how was your trip there? <laughs> They're like, oh, I've never been. But, you know, I saw that Netflix show and it seemed scary. And I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> I'm not sure when the next random convo will be, but I hope you enjoyed this one. I absolutely loved meeting Julian, having him on the podcast. I was so excited just because I just love how genuine and authentic he is both in his content and in person and he's just traveling this continent in such a way that he honors the communities that he gets to be injected in yeah it's just such a breath of fresh air i feel like a lot of travel content is so over glamorized and to a point you can't even connect with it and then I also find that a lot of travel content about Africa to be very condescending sometimes. Sometimes it's like, oh, look, I'm at an African hut. It's... <laughs> Do you, do you get what I'm saying? And I mean, Julian, I just feel the, the way he honors us as he tells his story while going through our continent that, that I feel 
drawn to. And I generally think like we need to have more visibility on Africa so that our true stories are amplified. A hundred percent stories by us about us need to be forefront, but also stories of black people from outside the continent are also needed in this kind of awakening we're going through. So in the show notes, I have put a link to two things. Jillian's YouTube channel, so you can check out the content we're talking about, and also his Instagram. So you can connect with him in case you want to learn more or know more about his solo traveling. If you have a story that you want to share on this podcast, if you're African, we want to hear it. Oh, I don't know why I sang it. All you have to do is click the link in the show notes, fill out the form, and I will get back to you. Remember, you can catch this podcast on Trace FM here in Kenya. All you have to do is go to traceradio.co.ke. We are there every Monday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. and Fridays at 1 p.m. Audio episodes like this, if you're new to the family, go out every single Monday. Make sure you subscribe on whatever platform it is that you're streaming this on. And you can check out our video and tour series right now. Just by heading to legallycluelessafrica.com. As usual, I am, um, you know, sending you a lot of grace. Be graceful with yourself this week. And as I keep saying to us, the end of the year, man, burnout is real. So if your body is demanding rest, give it rest. That's it for this episode of Legally Clueless. You can share this podcast with your friends. You can keep it for yourself. I'm not judging. Just make sure you're here next week for the next episode.